My last memory of my mother was when she kissed me and tucked me into bed before leaving to work the graveyard shift as a waitress at Denny's. The next morning on my way to school, I saw my mom's car parked on the side of the road. It turns out that was my mother's murder scene. The cops later said she'd been beaten to death. I was only 11 years old. I never knew who my father was, and after the murder of my mother, I went to live with my aunt, who was a drug dealer. I was with her one night when she was pulled over with drugs in her car. And I remember the lights flashing and my aunt telling me, John, if the cops find the drugs, say they're yours. I'm already on probation, and if I get caught with drugs again, I'll go to prison. What do you do when you're 17 years old and your mother's sister, the person who promised to protect you, tells you to take a drug charge for her? Little did I know that my answer to that question would change my life, that I would spend 18 years in prison and become a member of one of the largest prison gangs in the US. I wanted my aunt to accept and love me I already lost my mother and I fear that if I didn't do what she was telling me, I would lose her too. So when the cops found the drugs, I said they were mine. My aunt watched as I was handcuffed and placed in the back of a cop car. I was charged with possession, transportation, and sales of a controlled substance at the age of 17. And when I got to jail, I felt proud it's probably how many of you felt after you were accepted into Cornell. When I was released a few weeks later, my aunt celebrated and praised me for it, and I craved more. I committed my first aggravated robbery a couple of weeks after my release. Before year end, I would be convicted of four aggravated robberies and seven felonies. I was headed to a maximum security prison as a skinny, lost teenager. I've always had a strong desire to make money in advance. I'm a fast learner, a natural born hustler, and I have strong leadership skills. I knew these skills would be valuable in gang life and I made the most of them. Joining a gang gave me the family I'd been missing since my mother's murder. It was a way to gain power, respect, and to be accepted. My choices to engage in gang violence and criminal behavior resulted in me doing four terms in solitary confinement where I was locked in a cage the size of an elevator. Imagine being locked in an elevator without your cell phone for one hour, now for one day, now a week. I spent almost four years of my life in solitary confinement. Because of my choices, six additional years were added to my prison sentence. 13 years in, I was a 30-year-old gang member. I was on my fourth term in solitary confinement and I thought, this is where I'm going to die. I believed that dying in prison is what I'd signed up for as a gang member. And when I was incarcerated, plenty of my homeboys proudly wore the tattoo till the casket drops. There's no retirement plan for gang members. And California's highly organized gangs, there are only two ways out, dying or snitching. But when a gang member snitches, they're marked for death because they break the code of silence. For most gang members, they don't see a way out because there simply isn't one. I didn't see a way out. It's a lifetime commitment till the casket drops. Gang members go to prison and die so what's new? Pop quiz, true or false? Number one, gang crackdowns are slowing the growth of gangs. Number two, threats of harsh punishments like the death penalty deter people from joining gangs and committing crimes. Number three, Blocking gang leaders in solitary confinement strips them of their power. The answer to all of these is false. The gang problem hasn't been solved by the government or the police, and I don't believe they ever will. 
Threats of life in prison and tough on crime rhetoric don't scare anyone. They sure as hell didn't scare me. Most street gang activity is organized and led from solitary confinement and in the highest security institutions. The truth is that prison gangs and prison gang leaders are the ones who run the 32,000 street gangs that make up an army of 1.4 million gang members in the US. The average age for someone who joins a gang, 12 years old. People who are labeled the worst of the worst were at one point little kids, just like me on my way to school one morning. They joined gangs looking for acceptance and family, just like I did. They're looking for protection from other gang members who are threatening their homes and families. They're recruited by their own families. It's nearly always generational. Being from a gang is a birthright and prison or death is part of their inheritance. Gang members today have the power to recruit 12 year olds and essentially hand them a life sentence. They also have the power to deter them. This is Freddie. He did 32 years in solitary confinement and was first arrested at the age of four because he was with a family member who was arrested for shoplifting. In the land of the free, in the land of second chances, our officers possess handcuffs small enough to fit around the wrist of a four-year-old child. Being arrested at four, what were Freddie's chances of going to college? Did your parents graduate from college? Well, when a child's parents graduate from college, the child has a 55% chance of going to college. And well, what about when the parent has been incarcerated? The child is six times more likely to follow in their footsteps. The average 12 year old gang member, they're not planning for college. They don't even expect to live past the age of 18. What were you being prepared for at the age of 12? Were you, prepping in, were you prepping to get into the best high schools so you can get the highest SAT scores and get into the best colleges? You were kids on the brink of puberty. You wanted to be cool and accepted. And as you look back, you probably can't believe that you survived your teenage years. Now imagine, at 12 years old, being in gang wars, and being shot at every day, fighting to stay alive in a war zone, hearing gunshots in your neighborhood day and night, sleeping on the floor so you're not hit by a stray bullet. And then you're recruited by your own family to join a gang. Gang members usually don't have a plan for retirement because they don't live long enough. Their violent lifestyles claim them first. So how did I make it out and why am I here? Well, I somehow didn't get killed. And if I'd snitched, I wouldn't be here showing my face. In 2016, the day before my 33rd birthday and the day before I was supposed to be released, I sat in my cell alone, really wanting badly for the first time since my arrest to go home. I wasn't going home. The next day, I was starting another four year prison term for crimes I committed in prison. I concluded that day that I didn't wanna die in a box. My conclusion led to changes in my life and it didn't happen overnight, but I began separating myself from criminal activity and cutting ties with people who weren't willing to change. I was ridiculed and even threatened for my changes. I was called weak. My resolve was tested almost every day. Eventually, my choice, to, my choice to change was respected by some and even supported by gang leaders who wanted to see me go home and succeed. They didn't want to see me spend the rest of my life in prison. When I asked one of them, why do you want to see me go home? He said, John, you're a square. You don't belong in prison. 
if it was up to me, I would want all of you youngsters to go home and I'd be walking the prison yard alone. In June of 2019, after 18 years, I paroled from Pelican Bay State Prison. But why would gang leaders let anyone walk away? Why would they release their army? Would you believe that it all started with a lady, Cat Hoke? And despite that smile, she has the ability to scare even the toughest gang members, myself included. Cat came to Pelican Bay and prison officials there told her, don't waste your time. These guys are the worst of the worst. I'm grateful that she didn't listen. Instead of seeing these gang leaders as part of the problem, she saw them as humans. She believed that if anyone could solve the gang problem, it was them, not her. Imagine a United Nations meeting, but this time with some of, the America, some of the top gang leaders at the table. She invited them into one room and asked, if you died today, why would your life matter? When some tried giving BS answers, she challenged them to dream bigger and asked, what do you want for your grandkids, your communities? What do you want for the next generation? Do you want to be known for just your rap sheets? They let their walls down and showed a sacred side of themselves that few get to see. I am thankful for the privilege of knowing this side of them. And it's part of why I was able to change my life and go home. One of the men in the room that day shared that when he plays tea time with his granddaughter in the prison visiting room, she doesn't see a gang leader or the person who is serving life in prison for murder. She only sees her pop pop. They all want to be known for more than just being a gang leader or the worst things they've done. They wanted to be known, they wanted to create a legacy they could be proud of. And as part of this group, we believed that our voices and leadership could be used to create positive change. After being locked away and seen as the problem, we were empowered to be seen as the solution. In, June of two, in January of 2019, Cat Hoke hand-selected us onto the writing team. We felt like our existence mattered. Our voices would now be heard. Together, we named our organization Hustle 2.0. Our goal is to interrupt the cycle of gang violence and incarceration, and we are optimistic enough to believe that we can do it. Hustle 2.0 started at Pelican Bay State Prison, a supermax prison where California incarcerates the leaders of some of the most notorious gangs like the Mexican Mafia, the Crips, and the Bloods. What kind of power do some of these voices have when used for positive change? Statewide hunger strikes were organized in California prisons that involved over 30,000 incarcerated people peacefully protesting to end indeterminate sentences and solitary confinement. And guess what? The peaceful protests worked. Many of these same voices are now telling the younger generation the same thing that they told me. We don't want to see you in prison unless that's what you want. You are destined for more than dying in a prison cell. Our solution to interrupting the cycle of generational gang life is called squaring up. Squaring up is not a popular path right now, and it's not supported by all gang leaders, but it exists since 2019. Now imagine how hard it can be to stand up to a prevailing culture when you've been entrenched in it your whole life, and everyone around you is still entrenched. This is one of my co-authors, Daryl Baca. California placed him in solitary confinement for 32 consecutive years and identified him as a leader in the Mexican Mafia. He's been in prison for more than 40 years. Think about that. He's been in prison longer than I've been alive. Daryl was once a violent gang leader. Now, I've never met Daryl in person, but when I was at my worst, I wanted to be feared like him. Daryl's reputation as a gang leader inspired me, and he didn't even know I existed. Today, I still want to be like Daryl, 
and the way that he is using his leadership to help solve the gang problem from the inside. He is speaking out against gang violence and encouraging others to go to college, just like he did, earning his degree in sociology. He's encouraging people he's incarcerated with to be the first generation to go to college and the last generation in their family to come to prison. He's encouraging them to step away from gang and criminal activity. He is leading by example. Daryl is using his voice and leadership to be part of the solution. When I see his courage, I am inspired to share my story. The term squaring up was coined by our Hustle 2.0 writing team. And for it to mean anything, and for the action to be respected by other gang members, there are requirements. First come the four C's, the things we stop doing. And here's what we cut. Criminal behaviors, controlled substances and alcohol, crime partners, and criminal thinking. Then there are the things we start doing. We call these the four P's. Programming, taking personal responsibility, purposeful living, and engaging in a pro-social community. Squaring up isn't easy. Gang members are in a violent and dangerous environment. Their resolve to square up will be tested by other gang members, but I know that they were built for this. I did it and I am here today. The people that I met in prison are some of the most intelligent, determined people I have met. They are the solution to interrupting the cycle, if they choose it. And there's reason to be hopeful. The voices of Hustle 2.0's writing team are getting louder. And I believe that we can reach the more than 2.3 million people behind bars. Remember, I said squaring up isn't popular. Well, things are changing. One year ago, Hustle 2.0 was serving in two prisons in California. Today, we're serving in 75 jails and prisons nationally. When incarcerated people see the benefits of squaring up for themselves and the next generation, we see them making the courageous choice to square up, to choose giving up their birthright of dying in a box and passing on a new inheritance of freedom to the next generation. Our dream at Hustle 2.0 is to put ourselves out of business by ending the generational cycle of gangs, incarceration, and violence. When incarcerated parents square up, they guide their children down a new path and a new legacy. One that encourages 12-year-old kids to be more like the 12-year-old kids that you got to be. Kids who ride bikes and play sports and go to high school. And maybe one day, applied to Cornell University. Thank you.